Rajesh, could we have the live stream link to send to some people who might want to live stream to look at the at the recording rather than I mean sure, sure, sure. Moment. Yeah. I'll I'll soon put it in the chat. Okay. Yeah. So we can start. Over to you, Adar. Please start. Thank you, Arish. So hello, everyone, and welcome to the In Conversation series number 14, where Slavo Radosevic will be interviewed by Carlota Perez. My name is Arthur Moreira. I'm a final year PhD student at SPRU, University of Sussex, and I'm really happy to facilitate this event today. The In Conversation series portray prominent innovation scholars in the form of intellectual biographical interviews. So this is part of a, uh, the Chris Freeman Centenary Lecture Series, which is organized by the Consortium for Research on Innovation Studies, CRIS. <laughs> and the CRIS is a global network of innovation scholars working towards creating learning and competence building opportunities for early career scholars, especially from the global south. It was founded in 2021 Okay, uh, by a few early career innovation scholars who met at Globalix and bounded by its inclusive and egalitarian spirit. During COVID times, they got together to organize a lecture series on theoretical foundations of innovation systems, mainly for the benefit of students and early career researchers from the developing countries. It was named Christopher Freeman Centenary Lecture Series as it coincided with the birth centenary year of Chris Freeman. But in response to the huge demand from the audience, the activities continue beyond the centenary year. So please visit the network's website to watch the, the previous webinars and to have access to more material there. So today's two hour agenda is divided into two halves. In the first hour after these introductions, Carlotta will run an intellectual biographical interview with Slavo. Then we have a five minute break. So you can go drink some water, stretch your legs. And after the break, both the audience and a panel of three scholars will engage with Slavo. First the panel, then the audience. So please make sure uh, to type in your well friend questions in a precise form in the chat. Rajesh and I will keep track of the order. We'll pick them, the questions, and we will ask you to unmute yourselves and to ask the questions. The ones that can't be addressed because of time will be sent to Slavo afterwards. Contributing to the conversation between Slavo and Kalota are Gabriela Dutrenit, Janusz Kalogiro, and Nicolas von Ortas. And now we'll briefly introduce them later on. But my task here is very basic. I'm introducing Kalota, and she will be the one introducing Slavo. And I also have to keep track of time so all participants, including the audience, have the respective fair share of these two hours. So I start with Carlotta. I introduce her every so often in another series of webinars that we run together with the team in the discussion group on policy ex experience in Latin America. By the way, we have a, an activity on the 12th of December, but to, I can share it later on. Uh, but because today it is about Slavo's work and we want to hear uh, Slavo addressing Carlotta's questions, I'll keep it short. You can read uh, all the extended biographies in the network website, including the great exclusive autobiographical note that Slavo produced. Really good. Go there. So uh, just a small personal note. I want to thank Carlotta in the name of all young scholars present here, because many of us who had the privilege of being former or in London or in Tallinn and meet her know that she's really committed to interacting with us, giving as a bit of her time as a mentor and for me as a friend, sharing her beliefs about how we can contribute to try to influence better policy in the global south. And the others who haven't met her in person still benefit because she's very active in events such as this one. So thanks a lot. Carlotta is a British Venezuelan researcher, lecturer and international consultant. She's an honorary professor at the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose, UCL, 
and at the Science Policy Research Unit at SPRU, University of Sussex. She's also adjunct professor of technology and socioeconomic development at the Ragnar Nurse School of Innovation and Government at Tautec, Estonia. So over to you, Carlotta. Please say some words about Slavo and you can start your interview. Thank you. And don't forget. Thank you. Slavo, you should unmute yourself. Well, yes, uh, you hear me? Yes. Okay, it's great. Wonderful. I think it's a wonderful opportunity to be able to uh, talk to somebody who, apart from being an important contributor to the innovation literature, is, I would say, he is the top researcher in the whole of the Central, uh, Central and uh, Eastern European countries. But everything that he says is actually useful for every other aspect of the of the development world, the efforts for development. So I want to begin by asking Slavo something quite important because he is somebody who has spent more than seven years working as a public servant on top jobs in uh, the government of his original country, Croatia. And I think that's a very important aspect of why his work is so relevant. Precisely, I wanted to ask, Lavo, your experience of so many years in public service. It's, it actually makes you rather unique among innovation scholars, most of whom have spent their whole like, careers in the academic world. How much and in what way do you think that first-hand experience with practice inside government has influenced the way you study innovation policy? Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank organizers for uh, inviting me. It's a great, uh, really privilege, honor, and uh, moreover, to have Carlota you as a as, as a counterpart is, is something incredible. So I couldn't ask for for more um, because uh, I I'm not kind of a, a typical scholar in the sense as you rightly pointed in your question, who started in academy and then goes uh, along the academic lines. My first actually 12 years of career where you actually professionally form was done as a, as a civil servant, as a government economist, very much engaged in uh, uh, generating policy, analyzing first uh, policies. And uh, of course that shapes you. You know, first uh, 12 years of your professional development is something which, something which stays with you. And when I think about it, in which way it shaped me, I think first uh, it shapes me regarding the topics that you choose. They do not come kind of from um, economic theory as, as usual, you know, looking what other people have done or, or trying to uh, think from the academic side, but you primarily think about the relevance of the issues, you know, kind of whether they seem to you uh, kind of relevant from the um, kind of, let's call it reality check perspective. Then also your your research design and how you go is much more kind of down to earth uh, is is uh, different. But the most important, you try to uh, think much more about the policy implication. What does it tells me about the issue and problem that I'm looking? So in my case, uh, I give it really great importance because uh, in most of the academic papers, uh, policy implication, policy side comes like an afterthought of the analysis. You do analysis and say, oh, what does it, what it has to do, what, what can be done with that? In my case, uh, that's much more than the afterthought of the analysis. And actually, um, a few years ago, I um, had the privilege to look at the um, innovation studies literature, looking at the um, evolutionary perspective, different papers, with the aim to uh, really look at the policy implications of that or who needs that kind of and I managed to publish that in a because Korean's colleague invited me in, in, as a paper so you can read that kind of the the gap which exists uh, and pr I don't know if it will always exist between the academic discourse and the uh, policy implications and, and policy world but I'm continuously 
aware of this gap and, and probably what will characterize you know our debate is really the existence of 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 that gap whether that gap is something which is a natural cannot be bridged or something can be done in kind of making that gap uh, a bit narrower closer so yeah that would be my uh a brief uh, um, brief answer yeah quite important and you also worked interviewing firms in Croatia for a technology capability study, I understand. Uh, as you know, Chris, Chris Freeman, also did that in his early career before SPRU. How much do you think you learned by direct contact with entrepreneurs and managers of companies? I know you continue to contact firms whenever possible. But how much and in what way do you think those visits and conversations with real life innovators influence your theoretical work today? Yes, I'm kind of innovation studies scholar, the same as many people you know present here. And whenever I go even doing a kind of high level advisory policy consultancy uh, in some East European countries, then I always insist if possible. And in many cases, I succeed to to talk to uh, companies to understand how that kind of policy context is reflected in that. And um, early in my career, and even as a, as a government economist, I had the privilege to have a, a funding to uh, do firm level uh, research. And uh, that was the time in the in the 80s. I contacted uh, Carl Dahlman, maybe some people know the name, who was uh, one of the first uh, economies that uh, look at the uh, firms from technology capability perspective, because many people here uh, are working along these uh, lines. I know that Gabriela is, is, has done her PhD along these lines. So I, I simply asked him to send me the methodology questionnaire. That was the time when they were exploring the, I remember vividly, uh, Brazilian uh, company Usiminas and, and the others. So, so, so I found myself with the opportunity to uh, adopt fully uh, that approach and apply it in the case of uh, uh, several companies um, because I had people that uh, which were kind of sector specialists so I worked with them we visited these companies and I learned tremendously in that case actually I don't think innovation studies scholar can be a kind of fully fledged developed scholar without having in-depth understanding of processes which are going on and especially now, I think, with the cases of, of artificial intelligence, that may be even more important. However, that seems a, a, a kind of a, 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 a different. So uh, first thing you understand is the complexity of the firm itself. Firm is not a black box. Uh, you can read about the organizational capabilities. But one thing is going there and see you know, how companies are operating and what makes their organizational capabilities good or bad or, or, or average. This is something which, um, as, as we know from the literature, is very difficult to, to grasp, to understand. So that's the first thing. You get a much better understanding and you see the limitations of any data that you can you know, put uh, in relation to that company that is very difficult to grasp what makes that uh, firm unique or what makes it profile of capability as it is. And second thing is that uh, any enterprise operates in economic institutional context. I worked initially in my uh, early years in the socialist system, which was actually a system where you had a much more kind of, um, was not a centrally planned system, was a kind of, uh, had elements of strong market economy and, and very strong import substitution in that respect was very similar to um, Latin America. So that's why my kind of, intellectual inspiration from that time was largely from dependencia uh, literature but in, in terms of technology capability you understand how the the system of import substitution uh, shapes strategies of companies and why they behave in the way they behave when they have a, a strong uh, you know foreign trade uh, protection they are cost insensitive but then they have more uh, incentives to diversify to expand production so you you get a feel how companies' behavior is intimately and strongly separable from the features of the economic and institutional system of the social context in which they, they operate. And once you get that intimate understanding, then I think you carry that with you and, and that helps you uh, to understand really 
what is behind the the the, the, the data and, and uh, what statistical evidence can tell you and and what is behind that. So I, I find it um, essential for anybody who is uh, into innovation studies because innovation is uh, we know um, near superiors we don't follow micro macro distinction. We know that the a structural change takes place at a micro level, but it has a you know huge macro uh, implications, and and therefore to understand that dynamic, one has to have a you know good understanding of all three levels. But the micro level, firm level, is is the one where uh, that uh, transformation you see that it is kind of conflictual nature or trade offs in, in that transformation. Yeah, so that's um, in a nutshell why I think uh, that Chris was you know on the right track. Yeah, actually, uh, Chris often said that if you don't know what's behind the data, you don't understand what the data say. You've got to go directly. And today, uh, surveys and interviews are not in fashion. It's econometrics, econometrics, econometrics. So um, you do you think... I mean, you're constantly doing both. You work with data, but you also work with metrics. You talk to the public and private actors, but how do you feel that connection? Because you work a lot with metrics, but at the same time, you do the surveys. So uh, what's your view on that? You more or less just said something, but but you didn't talk about metrics as specifically what what's your your view on metrics uh, well we, we live today in a world where metrics uh, dominates it, it's actually you can't imagine anything uh, because of the sheer availability of data when i think about the availability of data 30 years ago and and now is another world so um um in science in research uh, there is this the solar price uh, a statement who says uh, instrumentation drives the progress in science. In our case, instrumentation, uh, data, computers now, and the whole social sciences becomes much more uh, information intensive, capital intensive. You can't do anything on your own. You have to have always uh, several people. And, and we know it in, in uh, not only in medicine, but in social sciences, increasing number of papers a quarter. So yes, I do uh, also a type of quantitative research, and I'm very lucky, privileged to work with people which are very good in um, quantitative methods. Also, I enjoy really exploring, analyzing uh, data, but at the same time, uh, one has to be aware what data can tell you, because data at the end indicates also social constructs. And today we can put data on anything, so to say, you know, kind of, if you think about the uh, different composite indicators, many variables are based on subjective data, and then we treat them as very, very objective, you know, kind of. So there's a lot of there kind of which uh, one can, you know, uh, 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 think about it. But I think uh, that both sides are necessary. The issue is only that uh, today we probably have a, a dominance uh, and, and a really uh, data rule all around, and we lose then kind of uh, qualitative insights. And the issue is uh, um, the balance between these two, but today we are on, on one side of, of that balance. And probably because the whole um, ICT goes in, in the sense that we will be able to, to monitor, quali quantify everything around. You know, I think that will actually increase the, the value of, of qualitative insight or something which is beyond the data exactly because you can uh, quantify everything. And that, will, that leads to this kind of uh, similar to, to when you have technological revolutions in your work, then the things which you codify then they open new areas for tacit knowledge. There is almost like dynamic relationship between the, yes, you understand something, but then you understand also what you don't understand and you understand it even more. And that's the kind of continuous cycle of the more you, you codify things, you understand, you quantify, then you see how quickly you know. You can do. So I see it as that kind of uh, uh, circle. The problem with the methodological, with the with the with the econometrics for me today, I think it's it's we are reaching the limits of of that approach. Is that the um, 
it's very difficult to grasp the context when you have a data. And to understand the data, you have to understand the context. And I take context much more seriously because um, in econometric literature, you have ambition that you can control for the context, that you, you can understand the context because it's a, you simply say, well, I control for all variables, you know, which are part of the context. But then when you think about the, there is a new research on, on causality in, in, in sciences, and, and uh, there is a very nice uh, uh, book of why by uh, uh, Judea Pearl and, and the other authors who basically clearly show that if you control for everything, then you basically introduce new biases. So there are limits to which you can uh, understand the context by controlling for all variables in, in that context. And the, the context is something which uh, we don't take seriously. I haven't seen the kind of monograph um, which would really kind of from, from philosophy of science point of view um, give us you know, something more in depth in terms of thinking of, of relationship between the variables and the, uh, and the context, because context cannot be reduced to, to control um, uh, variable. Of course, case study method offers the best way to, to contextualize these explanations. And in my kind of own uh, work, I, I learn a lot from very good case studies. And there are a few colleagues, some of them are actually even probably listening, uh, watching this. I can say I learned from more from your qualitative insight than from many econometric papers. Why? Because econometric paper has to start with hypothesis. You know, so you already have a kind of a view. And we know that in many cases, this is simply falsification of the process, because in, in reality, what you do, you try to explore, you try to find something new. You know, kind of, and, and in case study approach, uh, very often you have much more scope to discover something new, to be surprised. And especially in the context of, of, of again, technological change, there are new things which you cannot predict. Who can know how artificial intelligence will influence organizational capabilities of firms? This is something which you really then have to uh, talk with people and try to understand it better. So opening new lines of inquiry, I think uh, is, uh, is something which is, extremely important and can be done mainly in a qualitative way. After that, what we see, what I see in, in, in economics is actually, uh, I see qualitative insights and then comes a bunch of uh, econometric studies. Why? Because the question is formally. There is a kind of a paradigm established, you know, and then comes, okay, now now you have an industry of papers which, which tries to, but there is this qualitative insight which kind of comes from, from individual insight. And, and that's why I consider that kind of as, as a really complementary and, and issues of, of the right uh, balance between these two. Yeah, so that's in the it's in a not, nutshell. It's how not really a choice. It's not really a choice for for students currently. I mean, they're really the publish of perish force is just pushing them into doing mainly econometrics. It's really difficult for them to, to choose. But let's move on to your area of specialization now. Because you come from well, Croatia. Maybe, maybe Carlotta, just, just to maybe complete that, uh, I, I forgot that. Uh, I think that this boundary between qualitative and quantitative is uh, fortunately or unfortunately kind of um, a breaking down with the methodologies which uh, basically merge both perspectives. Uh, even if you think about machine learning, you know, kind of this is something which you, 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 you try to. Uh, you know, get from a variety of sources, uh, and and then you try to, in a quantitative way, to explore it. If you think about the uh, there is methodological qualitative comparative analysis where you take case studies and then you try to you know uh, distill variables from that, and then you can uh, test it. So the things are now much more diverse, but there is this dominance still today. I think it's it's changing, but you are right. You know there is a dominance of. Um... <laughs> well, that's very good news. I hope you're right. <laughs> okay, yeah. uh, coming from Croatia in the former Yugoslavia, Yugoslavia, you have mainly specialized in the Central and Eastern European countries and the Soviet Union. Uh, not many innovation scholars study that region. So which would you say are the main specificities of innovation systems there? And how has the restructuring taken place after the change into market economies? Well, this is a, a question where you try, um, which will actually be the topic of my book, which I'm, I was supposed to start already now, and I'm 
starting very slowly, but struggling to find time in addition to hundreds of other things. Uh, because there is this uh, complex uh, transformative process of the last uh, 30 years where uh, many people know bits and pieces of that. And, and I've kind of been privileged enough when I came to Spru to uh, to specialize in that. I, I didn't want to move to, to, to something else because I said this is where I have some understanding. But if I was to kind of try a you know, kind of, uh, few bullet points uh, to say what is a kind of... A, uh, main specificity and how the restructuring process has taken place. Uh, uh, I think after 30 years, if I look at it from the innovation system perspective, then one could say innovation system in these countries are still not kind of business sector based. They are still uh, um, have a lots of legacies from the past, which are partly developmental legacies. The, the, the legacy was that, that uh, firms were not the main agents of innovation process because the innovation was scattered uh, the, the, the whole range of um, business functions was scattered across the hierarchy. Of course, that was very much different in my country where I come from, from former Yugoslavia countries, uh, when I compare it with the a kind of uh, orthodox Soviet system, where indeed the whole business functions, if you think about the marketing, which was in foreign trade organization, R&D was in industrial institutes, in Academy of Sciences, uh, procurement was in another uh, ministry, and uh, uh, so the commonality of in transformation process is how do you reconstitute enterprises in from something which were just production units, even not having finance departments, you know, kind of, and how did they become reconstituted as individual enterprises? And that process was very much different from country to country because they were um, having a kind of they were on a different distance compared to the kind of this uh, orthodox Soviet system and was much easier in country where I uh, in countries where I come from, you know, kind of. So. Uh, and then we have, so that is one commonality. Then we have a, a common restructuring processes, erosion of R&D in all countries to different degrees. Then we have a recovery, and then we have a, a, a erosion during the 90s. Then we have a recovery during the 2008. And after 2008, we have a, a really a new processes of um, diversion, slowing over growth, and a kind of issue, well, what are the new drivers? And this is something which is kind of uh, evolving uh, before our eyes. Uh, and the system, if we think from, from innovation system perspective, are um, very much fragmented. And I call them dual innovation system in the sense that you have, a, in many countries, you have a dominance of FDI, but the issue is whether this FDI integrated, what are the spillovers from FDI? So that kind of, in many cases, unrelated to the to, to the rest of the enterprises, and then you have on an upstream side, especially in, in countries which are members of the EU, you have this integration of R and D system into the EU Excellence Network. But in between, you don't have much. So there is a kind of dual innovation uh, system, which is a kind of um, reflection of the nature of integration of these economies, but represent also the um, structural weakness. So so this is in a kind of Nutshell on a very, very rough uh, sketches, uh, you know, first uh, take. Of course, there is a, a variety of country differences, uh, and, and these are kind of all, let's call it, different shades of gray. Uh, so, yeah, so, so that's the, in a nutshell, how I would, um, yeah, mm. would describe it rough, very roughly. You know, kind of. This separation makes me wonder if the, um, if this idea of the risk of having an R&D entrepreneurship uh, sort of to promote that sort of thing without connecting it with the bulk of the industry of the country might actually be a mistake. We might, we might be interested in looking at that problem. Innovation scholars and national systems of innovation and so on could risk promoting innovation in, in isolation rather than promoting innovation within companies. But anyway, yeah. that's, those are those uh, are things uh, to think about. No, no, yeah. you, 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 hit, you hit the right uh, point because uh, this is also partly driven by the dominant policy discourse, which is not only Eastern Europe. I mean, there are people here from Latin America, from Asia, and uh, there is a view of innovation policy which is reduced on the R&D based growth. Therefore, you support uh, new technology based firms. You know, kind of. But then when I look at this part of the world, the new technology based firms are part of the segment. They are macroeconomically still not important. And, and then you completely ignore 
what is going on in the existing enterprises, especially in the larger enterprises of their linkages. So there is a kind of uh, lots of biases why this situation is like it is today, because it can be corrected. It could have been corrected, you know, but it's a, we are part of the story of that because we don't give enough attention to the overall uh, range of uh, technology activities because some of them are difficult to to grasp, to capture. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, you know, you, you just talked about the heterogeneous nature of both the the countries themselves because of their past, some some having been completely centralized, some perhaps not so much, and some having had a previous development like Czechoslovakia and that were that were European semi-advanced countries before. So actually that makes a lot of difference. Do, do you think that we appreciate that sort of heterogeneity elsewhere? I mean, how important do you think it is to actually look at that at those differences? Yeah, I work on the on the region which actually stretches from uh, Estonia, Baltics, I come from Balkans, which is south there, you know, uh, lots of connections in Greece. And then I, at the same time, uh, I'll be going in a few weeks time to Uzbekistan, which is Central Asia, which is completely different parts of the world. So we have a kind of region which uh, um, people think how you can look at that kind of huge diversity. Well, uh, there are countries at different levels of development and these differences were there 150 years ago. And some of these differences are still uh, present uh, today. And, and I think that uh, um, a richness and this diversity is something which I kind of appreciate because then you understand the relationship between the uh, technology accumulation, so to say, and economic restructuring, you know, economic growth. You, you understand that uh, our discussion before about the metrics, that you cannot have one metrics, that these are kind of uh, countries and different uh, uh, levels of uh, development, different types of, of economic system, different political economies from authoritarian to kind of more liberal democracies. And of course, then we have also within the European Union, also something that's called a liberal uh, kind of democracy. So so the story becomes even more uh, complicated. Then you had this uh, transition. So there were differences in, uh, from the past. Then we have differences during the 90s, during this transition period uh, where um, uh, the the differences in political economy in the sense to which they were kind of embracing the, the Washington consensus uh, logic, the extent to which they tried to uh, engage in a very much different way towards the uh, foreign capital and technology. In some countries, this is a drama which evolves uh, until today. In some countries like uh, current members of the EU, you know, kind of they, they didn't have almost structurally choice, you know, kind of. So these are countries which are very much... Uh, uh, dominated by foreign direct investment. So I have this kind of distinction which uh, uh, I, I developed between the domestic-led and foreign-led modernization, kind of, which is uh, hugely uh, reflected in the patterns of technology accumulation, the data which you see in these uh, countries. You have differences in terms of uh, uh, resources. In some countries you have uh, resource-based ranks, which completely kind of squeeze this... Uh, uh, push for technology rents. In other countries, they don't have choice. And the technology rents creation possibility, you know, to, to grow is the only uh, uh, option. So, uh, <clears throat> and then we have processes which will kind of shift towards the market economy during the 90s, but then hitting the, the, the limits of that. You know, kind of you, you have a, then a, um, a reversal of this transition process, uh, which goes back from marketization so to say towards stronger role of uh, of state which now you know come becomes more normal as as the uh, state has is, is coming back and very different uh, roles of the state in, in that uh, uh, context so it's a kind of for me is extremely a rich area where uh, uh, linking what uh, we as innovation scholars are doing with the overall social context and social conditions of that innovative enterprises are hugely important research area, but unfortunately there are not many of us who are working in a comparative way in this part of the world. There are only a few people here, some of the colleagues here. So I think it's a huge uh, gap in innovation studies area. So I, I hope uh, I'm, I'm just one who probably uh, my ambition is through that book to, to show to the others that this is a, 
uh, that in the context of, of the emerging economies, that there is a part of the world which requires kind of a research in itself. It, it's enough interesting and, and relevant uh, and can provide us a, a range of uh, new um, insights. Yeah. So I think that's mm -hmm. enough for... for... Yeah. You have often mentioned that Mariana points out that innovation is political. And, uh, and that has some consequences that maybe we don't take into account usually. Do you... How, how do you... I point that out. Uh, well, uh, I prepare intentionally. Uh, this is Mariana's, uh, uh, I don't know if you can see. Uh, yeah, innovation. This is uh, from Mariana. Uh, this is a kind of card which she has. Uh, she has also um, uh, a T-shirt which are uh, saying the same. Uh, because I think that the, of course, in our area, innovation studies, you can be very technocratic, I would say, and you can reduce uh, everything on your data. You look at the indicators, you look at the growth, uh, you explore the, what determines innovation, what determines pro uh, firm productivity, and you can stay within that uh, um, angle. And, you know, I, I'm quite fine with that. There's nothing wrong with that. But we know that at the end, uh, uh, something which I, I think the, the term is, is correct one can be called technology accumulation is a social, political, economic, broader process, and is shaped by a variety of forces. Who controls the modernization process? Who are the owners, you know, kind of, of, of companies? What is their strategic horizon? What is the strategic horizon of the state? How is the, who is in control of the state? These are all issues which are shaping the technology accumulation. So I, I think that the, uh, and especially now today with the, with the role of the high tech or big companies, that becomes even more important. So I think that the whole new agenda will come in the future, which I would call political economy of technology accumulation. And also, uh, finally, your work and, and your, uh, your your future book is is uh, will reveal a lot of these things, uh, and and will you know I think will be one of the major contributions uh, to this area. So uh, I think uh, world is in your in your side. Thank you. Thank I'm you just trying to to to. to <laughs> Good. Now, now let's go to your contributions. You have developed metrics, surprisingly, for evaluating technological upgrading. Tell us a bit about that. And would you say, again, that your first-hand experience was an important input that gave you both the capability and the desire to design how, how to do that sort of measurement? Uh... Yes, now you hit the kind of wh why I, um, how did I come to that? I didn't come to that kind of, oh, thinking something uh, theoretically. It, it simply came to, for a very simple reason. In the European Union, in Europe, we have a dominant metric, which uh, many people uh, watching this know, European Innovation Scoreboard. And then I work on these countries, which are kind of, uh, were at the bottom of that scale of, of European Innovation Scoreboard. And from my perspective, uh, you know, um, many of the indicators there were not really the, the most significant for these countries. And especially, I was annoyed with the fact that policymakers in these countries then take these indicators as policy objectives. So to give you an example, you know, I, I, I listen to a Hungarian policymaker who suddenly worries that uh, Hungary doesn't have many U.S. patents. And why? Because on, on that scale, they are really, uh, well, relatively behind, definitely behind the uh, uh, top countries. But then I was kind of annoyed with that idea that that policymaker uh, took that as the main problem of the country because he looked at the metrics only. And on the metrics, you know, if he increases some of the indicators, he will go up and he thinks country will do well. But he's basically chasing a relevant point because country is not at the technology frontier. U.S. patent is important, but it shouldn't be the objective of the policy. There are many other kind of policy issues and indicators which can reflect that. So uh, I came to that uh, um, being fully aware that uh, metrics are hugely important today in the world because metrics are not just numbers. Metrics define and structure the problem. So in this case, if I tell you U.S. patent is your main problem, then you think, my God, yes, my frontier science is my main problem. But you are middle-income economy, let's say, and then U.S. patent is not your main problem. You have a range of other major problems. But then how do you generate the kind of 
structured metrics and framework for for uh, problems which are more relevant for you. So basically, I came to that as as a my reaction to this idea that there can be one universal metrics, and and that's why I came with a colleague with the uh, with Essen York, who I'm very grateful we work together and and do some quantitative analysis also uh, to um, show that there is alternative metrics which uh, is suitable for a specific group of countries. And I don't believe that there can be one general metrics in the case of, of technology accumulation, because you operate on so many different levels of countries which have production capability problem, which have a problem of absorption. Uh, only some companies are maybe on the technology frontier. So uh, so this is the idea that uh, uh, metrics uh, framework how we structure the problem, and therefore uh, we shouldn't take them as a, as a gods. And, and the more of them, the better, because then we show uh, how problem can be presented. And, and, and then policymaker can choose which one of them is most relevant for them, because the dominance of one metric is, is, a, is, is a devastating. Uh, well, today, maybe we have too many of them, but each of them is based on some kind of understanding of, of the real processes. So this, in some way, this is a fight uh, to, to, for the relevance of, of metrics. Yeah, so that's how I see it. Uh, you can do. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I think you always say that uh, realistic measurements are more important and more useful than ideal ones. Uh, so now, referring to that same relationship between what is innovation at the frontier and what is learning from behind, uh, after working all these years with innovation and development, what would you say is the essential part played by innovation in the process in contrast with learning to, to sort of catch up? And how do you see the connection happening? What, what's your... Um, yes, uh, that is a, a question where, where I have a problem to... Uh, to separate uh, innovation from learning, because for me, innovation is a uh, part of the learning. And uh, it, it, it's uh, why, because uh, learning, for me, these are processes by which uh, 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 innovation gets uh, adapted, uh, gets improved. Uh, and learning is, at the end, core of organizational capabilities, because organizational capabilities of firm uh, a reflection of the variety of learning processes which takes place in a company. And I, I'm sure that uh, uh, Gabriela, who, who, who will come later on, has a lot to say uh, about that. And, and whether that learning takes place or not is then, you know, really a crucial question. Because if learning takes place, innovation will come by itself, kind of. So, um, so in, in that uh, respect, uh, the most interesting things, of course, we have a research which looks at it entirely on a firm level, but there are learning processes which you can see, which are also conditioned by the by, by the broader factors in the in, in the social system. This is a kind of, for me, also um, a new unexplored uh, area. That's why I like this Lazarus idea of social conditions of innovative enterprise, because these social conditions determine the type of learning that takes place, and then that leads to uh, specific types of um, innovation. So for me, these are kind of two facets of, of the same issue, yeah. Hmm. Now I'd like to go to my favorite topic, institutional innovation. This is something I've been fighting for for years. To me, it's increasingly important for successful development processes to learn about in how institutional innovation is made. And I don't see enough efforts trying to understand what successful policies are, why they are successful, how does policy innovation take place, how to evaluate innovation policy so that we can learn more about how to innovate in policy. Do you agree that this is a problem? I mean, you have done research on learning networks and other policy innovations. Do you think the innovation studies community has paid enough attention to that? Policy innovations, you mean? Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, you, you I mean, started... I mean, innovation yeah. in government, innovation in the institutions that actually handle development, because we seem to think that innovation only happens in business, you know, somehow, yeah, yeah. maybe yeah. organizational innovation, but policy innovation is 
crucial. And now more than ever when the state is coming back and we have no idea how those things are done, how, how you can promote it to happen more. I mean, it's really a big, big gaping hole, I feel. Mm, well, we, we are moving from the comforts of the, let's say, economics of technological change towards this dirty world of, of the uh, policy where the boundaries also between uh, innovation policy studies and uh, public policy. And, and in my recent work with uh, George and Desmina, I was forced to kind of to, to enter into a range of literature which is beyond the innovation uh, uh, policy. Uh, and uh, well, policy innovations, they belong to part of a generic category of institutional innovations and I'm kind of skeptical uh, towards the term itself, because uh, I think that the institutional innovations and policy innovations, uh, they are to a large extent uh, also results of the political processes and whether uh, something can be on a paper fantastic, uh, but at the end, whether this will be implementing implemented and how it will be shaped is really dependent on a variety of uh, political factors in, in, in the country. Uh, to maybe our discussion can be focused about the uh, yes that there are policy innovations uh, uh, in 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 this area. If you think about the new public uh, management, which was dominant uh, until recently, that was a, one kind of innovation. But that was a reflection of policy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So 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 there are innovations uh, in the in our case in, in case especially in Europe we have this innovation which is called uh, a smart specialization, which was a policy invention, so to say. From Dominique Faure and 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 to other colleagues, kind of, uh, and that was a kind of a situation where, uh, uh, so to say, conceptualization went ahead of the practice, and and then everybody is trying to understand uh, what it is. Um, you are absolutely right that there is not enough systematic thinking of the new ways how to go about it. You know, kind of, and uh, I work on the region where actually anything about the policy that was done was taken from the shelf of the EU, so to say. And you have this uh, huge uh, uh, problem of, uh, of bias in that context. You have an uh, incapacity to understand uh, what are your technological challenges or uh, upgrading challenges and what will be uh, appropriate policy instruments. So in that respect, um, I see the lack of policy innovation as an inability to uh, have this critical distance towards your own understanding. Of, of the of, of your uh, uh, country sectoral context. So in a to a large extent, these are kind of uh, blind spots which are very much result of the dominant paradigm. If people think that the innovation comes from R and D, they will forget about any other policies because they will be focused on on R and D uh, tax credits. You know, kind of. So uh, the problem is um, uh, partly academic, but to a large extent, this is a kind of dominance of. Um, of, of the discourses, which is a partly academic, but partly is, is a culture, political, and, and so on. So it's a it's a messy, messy area where we uh, academics in this area have also part of our responsibility. Yeah, so we, we are part of the problem as well. Yeah, what I find most painful is that while political scientists who know nothing about innovation are doing work on policy design, the people who are expert in innovation are not studying that process, which is so crucial because without policy, everybody says policy recommendations. So you actually mean that the instrument to do what it is that you're studying is actually not studied. You, you, you know, so it's a hole. It's a huge hole. I find it very strange. But anyway. Yeah. yeah. No, no. It, it, but may, maybe the reason is that, that the subject that we are studying is also continuously changing, you know, kind of. So it, it's almost like a, it's changing because we we work in an area which kind of uh, cannot be, so to say, cannot have its established paradigm uh, because the subject is changing. Your if you have to think about the policy for artificial intelligence today, it's quite different from the you know basic digitalization ten years ago or something which was a kind of thirty years ago dominant, you know, kind of. So. Uh, we are changing with uh, we are faced with a continuously changing uh, setting in which we operate. So that's a small excuse. Just uh... yeah, all the more important to understand how <laughs> how policy has to change. With it. 
But I agree, anyway, I agree fully. Let's, yeah. let's go to to your contributions. Um, if you had to choose only two of your contributions, one or two, to the field of innovation studies, which ones would you pick? Well, I hope I'm, I'm not still that old that I can say finally any major contributions, but uh, let me put it on a much more, you know, down to earth level. Uh, I can, if I think uh, a bit more critically, I will say, yes, I contributed um, in some areas a little bit conceptually. Uh, I developed, you know, this idea of entrepreneurial propensity of innovation system. Uh, why? Because uh, I was surrounded by colleagues who were working on entrepreneurship as an uh, individual phenomenon, you know, crunching uh, um, this data uh, which exists in, in, in GEM, Global Entrepreneurship Monitor, and I was coming from a system of innovation. And then the whole idea was, uh, yeah, entrepreneurship is also a collective phenomenon. It's not only individual phenomenon. Of course, this was a reflection why they were working or this idea of the whole neoliberal system that the heroic entrepreneur, very Schumpeterian kind of. Well, I, I'm more inclined towards this uh, kind of seeing also that the individual does not operate in, a, in an empty vacuum. So on the, on the empirical side, I've done a lot of uh, kind of uh, work on, on East European countries trying to show exactly that the determinants of, of uh, growth in these countries are much more related to uh, which Martin Bell, Keith Pavitt would call production capability. Um, we even have a recent paper, uh, Econometrical, where we show that uh, productivity is driven by, not by, by uh, R&D, but is driven by production capabilities. So I try to kind of uh, bring uh, the, the insights from the innovation studies and then kind of checking them, testing them through empirical work on, on, on this part of the world. And of course, all thinking about the uh, innovation system is, uh, is, is there. So, but... I would say, I hope I haven't done my last word, so. Uh, good, no, I'm sure you haven't. So uh, now, uh, sort of going back to the beginning, do you think that personal experience, field work and interviews are important for academics to be able to make relevant recommendations? Would you recommend that somehow they manage to, to connect more strongly yeah, we, we come to the beginning how we started uh, because you put point on these recommendations um, because I had experience on both sides and, and I know how our work uh, uh, operates in the context of when it comes on, on the table of, of, of administrator or of high level policymaker. Then I would say uh, that our major impact is not in the recommendations. Uh, that may disappoint some people. This is not like idea uh, enlightened policy makers said, oh, I didn't know that. Thank you very much. This is a genius proposal. Uh, why? Because I think uh, uh, the, the whether he will implement that recommendation or not depends on a variety of other factors. You are just one of the inputs. So I think our main impact uh, will be in the way how we frame the problems from which then some recommendations will follow. So I, I, I would say that I feel much happier when I change the way how policymakers think. This is the same as with students. When you give a new perspective to students and when you influence uh, policymakers in, in a way uh, how he see the problem. Now, if he see problem now in a different way, I think you've done your job because the solution, he is the one who knows much better what will be the solution as long as you agree on the definition of the problem. So this is how I would uh, uh, evaluate our impact. Mm. Yeah. Oh. Okay, my closing question. Which is the most important advice you regularly give your PhD students? Uh, I have a... Are many, I'm people. sure there are many PhD students <laughs> listening now and many are going to watch the recording. So what yes. do you tell them? My advice uh, comes based on first uh, how I tell them what is the, the, the activity that they are now in? I, say, I tell them, first, you have to understand that uh, what you are engaging now in your activity is a very cruel activity. Why cruel. it is cruel? It's cruel. It's cruel an activity because nobody will clap you. You know, first of all, uh, everybody will uh, have to criticize you by definition. Why your work doesn't work? Why your model doesn't work? You know, kind of, so you will not have many praises. 
uh, you will not have much of recognitions. And second, if you want to get the kind of recognition formal, be prepared for a, for a long, long run. Because by the time your paper gets read, by the time it gets uh, cited, wait, wait, wait. You have to survive un until then. And then you are entering into this peerage system. You are in a peer review system, uh, which is much more in a crisis today. And then this opens the whole range of questions for you. How are you going? What is what will be your strategy? Are you aiming high? What if you get uh, terrifying reviews? Are you going to stick to that? What topics you will choose? So you are faced with a range of questions which are not uh, a kind of scientific objective because in social sciences, especially, this is also a social uh, political system and you have to have a lot of guts and energy to go through that. So you will have a very low point and, and try to, to stay straight and uh, try to stay uh, sane. And many of the choices that you will be faced will be also moral choices, whether you go more opportunist route whether you go kind of more what your instinct uh, uh, tells you. So the fact that you are in that area doesn't resolve you of the problems of which you even didn't uh, uh, dream until now. So, so it, it's a cruel activity. Try to stay you know, true to your ideals, connect with the good people and try to enjoy it. So that would be, the, at the end, uh, the final point. <laughs> your ideals and try to enjoy it. Yes, exactly. Definitely. Try to enjoy it. It's a very tough life. Thank you very much. It's been really fascinating to discuss with you. And I will hand over for the five minute break. Arthur. It's a great pleasure. Pleasure as always, Carlota. Exactly. Thanks a lot, Carlota, for putting the quest together. And thanks a lot, Slavo, for providing your insights. And as mentioned, we have five minutes now. So I'll see you when the clock ticks uh, for me, two in the afternoon, one in, in the UK and so on and so forth. So see you in four to five minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. So meanwhile, meanwhile we, have, uh, we have a brief announcement, small announcement. Our Excuse next. Welcome. Yeah. Welcome. Welcome. You, you were clear. Yeah. You were clear. It's, you were clear. It was not. Yeah. Uh, I think. Our next uh, conversation is on 28 January. Uh, between. Uh, we, we, we feature uh, Professor Abdul Qadir Jafflat. Uh, Abdul Qadir will be interviewed by Alexis Javier Amie uh, on. 28 January 2024. We will alert you. We have uh, plenty of time. We'll send you the brochure and the program details as usual. And one particular word of thanks to uh, University of Malaya North South Research Center, UMNRSRC, uh, for providing, uh, supporting us with the Zoom platform. And this is a joint uh, effort a collaborative effort between Association for South-South Cooperation for Innovation Systems Transformation, ASSIST UK, uh, Chris Network, and University of Malaya North-South Centre. And particularly, I thank uh, Professor uh, Angatevar Baskaran, who has been instrumental in this support. Thanks, Bas, for this.
ಪರ್ಫೆಕ್ಟ್ ಟೈಮಿಂಗ್ ಯಾವ್ದ ಪರ್ಫೆಕ್ಟ್ ಆಲ್ ರೈಟ್ ಯಾ ಐ ಥಿಂಕ್ ವಿ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಅ ಗೆಸ್ಟ್ ದಟ್ ವಿ ನೀಡ್ ಟು ರಿಮೂವ್ ದೊ ಸೊ ಲೆಟ್ ಮಿ ಜಸ್ಟ್ ಟೇಕ್ ಅ ಮೊಮೆಂಟ್ ರೆಡಿ ಯಾ okay i think i think i i you can do it. that you you are a co-host yeah. you can do that yeah i expelled it uh Please, all yeah. right okay so we're back uh so f- right now welcome back uh the next hour we have a panel of three scholars and they'll have questions and have comments towards isabel's work Uh, after the response to the panel the audience will be uh, invited to participate so each of the panelists will have around 12 to 15 minutes to interact with the level and I'll quickly introduce them so today we have Gabriela do Trenit PhD uh, from Spru full professor of economics at the Universidad Autonoma Metropolitana UAM in Mexico City She has been a long time coordinator of Lalix, the Latin American part of Globalix. We have uh, Nicholas von Ortas, PhD in economics from the New York University, professor of, of economics and international affairs at the George Washington University in the US. He's senior associate dean at the Elliott School of International Affairs. And third, Yanis Kalogiro, PhD in industrial economics at NET UA, the National Technical University of Athens, where he's an emeritus professor of economics of technology and industrial strategy and co-founder and former director of the Laboratory of Industrial and Energy Economics. So, Gabriel, please go ahead. Okay. Thanks a lot, Arthur, for the invitation to participate in this in conversation it was very interesting the interaction between carlota and slavo very very interesting and let me put some some points that in some way were approached but uh, i would like to 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 focus my my questions in this point that are important for developing countries and emerging economies no uh, first of all the analysis of catching up in emerging economies is directly directly related to the reduction of productivity gaps in contracts the analysis of the accumulation of technological capabilities refers to other technical organizational and management dimensions of companies and countries how much do these two approaches dialogue or has the catching up approach surprised surfaced that of technological capabilities and connected to that because you were talking a lot about the the issue of the metrics which is a, a concern that you have in relation to these processes for which approaches is there the most shortage of metrics mm, yes uh, you are pointing to really a huge gap when uh, economists market economists you read all kind of uh, this respective uh, highly rank, uh, regarded reports where technology is is reduced on total factor productivity on productivity while we do not operate uh, near competitive economies we we do i mean sometimes uh, you you find that but it's not the dominant metrics because we can capture technology in a much more direct uh, way so uh, the way i see it i i see that the technology uh, capabilities they are uh, first of all they are indicators for me indicators of it depends how you treat it as an input or an output but labor productivity is something which you see as an output while technology capability for me is a, is a um can be considered not as an objective also by itself but as as a kind of input as a as a capacity which tells me what is the possibility for that economy to uh to increase further productivity but i wouldn't idolize productivity as such because not to talk about the total factor productivity which we don't know what it is there is a lot of critical papers about it but the productivity itself uh you don't know what is uh, what is behind that because you can uh, achieve high productivity in the short term simply underpricing labor you can have a 
very high productivity in some sectors simply because they're monopolies. Uh, you, you may have a productivity behind which is a simply different structure, you know, kind of structural differences, you know, kind of. So uh, for me, these are not two approaches which, are, which should be in competition. The issue is only that uh, uh, where some jobs would have to be done, how to bring um, technology in its different facet as a part of the toolbox of macroeconomies. How do you bring technology into macro modeling? That would be for me the, the, the challenge. So uh, any kind of, uh, finally, if you read very good reports, they will always rely on much more direct indicators of technology capability. It doesn't mean they will not have a, a, a labor productivity, but I think this should be a different size of the story. And as long as economists understand what they give you, I think um, this is more about the uh, good coexistence rather than uh, one displacing the, the other. So that would be the, the way how I see that. Yeah. But you know, uh, uh, researchers from Asia use catching up, up, the catching up approach, but researchers from Latin America, we don't like this approach and we use more development and technological capability accumulation. We try to focus on the issue, the discussion on other side, no? much more related with the the what development means in terms of uh, economic, social, uh, also um, environmental issues, and not just that catching up that is measured by patents and etc. No, Asians do it because they, they could more clearly show you know that they were catching up. Although what drives that then it opens huge debate. You know, kind of then yeah. that is another side of the story. <laughs> yeah. 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 But anyway, related, related with this, the same issue, what type of policies are most directly related to this approach? I would think that in the catching up approach, there is more integration, interaction with industrial policy, while in the accumulation of technological capability approach, the STI policies matter more. What do you think about, about this and why? I think uh, this is a kind of what you are uh, pointing is maybe more echo of the past where really the, uh, let's say in EU, uh, until recently, there was no industrial policy, there was only innovation policy, and there was a strong distinction between these two. But now this distinction is breaking up. It's breaking up in the sense that uh, US has a very strong industrial policy. EU is uh, building its industrial policy. That industrial policy cannot be only industrial policy. It has to be linked to uh, innovation policy. Moreover, now we have this transformative innovation policy, which you can call just transformative because it's also about the industry, uh, where the whole issue of, of broader transformation, where innovation is not the only one, but it's one important ingredient. So I think uh, uh, we have to understand that the, 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 the current context uh, blurred much of our kind of uh, previous uh, uh, concepts. So I would say that uh, uh, we are now more in a kind of integrated uh, area where, where these distinctions are less helpful. Uh, they're not so useful as they used to be in the past. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah. of okay. course, different parts of the world are in, in, different, uh, in, in different stages of that. I'm talking mm -hmm. from the position of the EU where this transformative is a you know, mantra of the day. While in, in other parts of the world, I, I can see that this is still not in the agenda even of, 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 uh, of academics, so. Yeah, 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 I agree. Well, let me move to, to another, uh, the last question, which is related to this, but in relation to the transformative innovation policy framework, which is today under discussion, as one of the frameworks in the innovation policy, you know? How useful is the transformative innovation framework for these two approaches, particularly the, the emphasis that this transformative innovation policy put on local experimentation rather than, uh, rather than national uh, issues? Yes, now you are hitting the, the really the, the emerging problem because uh, Everybody kind of on a conceptual level accepts transformative innovation policy. But uh, we were in contact recently because I'm editing with a, with a colleague who's trying to edit a research handbook on regions and transformative innovation policy. And we are struggling to find contributors from emerging economies, so kind of from, from the global south, which tells me that, uh, you know, even on a conceptual level, the idea is still not uh, 
um, uh, kind of uh, recognized. Although we understand that the nature of, of climate change requires solutions which are broad, transformative, which cannot be confined on industrial innovation policy. In that kind of. And in that context, uh, nobody knows how to go about it. I mean that's that's the 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 the, 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 the how it is you know kind of. of course we have a in terms of experimentation we we only have a randomized controlled trials but try to apply that innovation I mean God help you you know kind of because you can't do it you know kind of so we are at the early stages of of, of thinking uh, including Europe which is supposed to be on on forefront of that how to go about the experimental uh, policies and and this is a big question if you want to do a phd on on a new exciting topics then in innovation policy then experimental policy would be one of your uh, uh topics so highly recommend it no oh, yeah we have to experiment in policy the point is the level of the experimentation the focus and and the lack uh, of connection anyway. yes ex now now you hit me hit the the, the right point because uh the, my recent uh, issue is, is in the paper which you had, which is, yes, experimentation, fine, everybody accepts it rhetorically. But then you have a conventional public administration who says, hey, where is my money? You know, where, I, I gave you so much, what is the return? So you have this clash between accountability and experimentation. And then what you get, you, you get mimicry. You get, you know, kind of just rhetorics without much changing in practice. Yeah, so... Okay, thanks a lot, and then I give the floor to to Rashid or to Arthur. Yes, thanks a lot. Thank you. Yes, thanks, Gabriela. So now we have uh, Nick Vonotas, please. Mm. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thanks for the invitation here. Um, I am honored actually to 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 see all these uh, good important people that I have been reading from throughout the years and learning from, right? Um, the discussion, uh, the, the questions of Gabriela actually, and the discussion with Slavo reminded me of the struggle that we had with Slavo two years ago in, in the book that we, we published by Oxford University Press, right? Um, uh, the challenges of technology and economic catching up in, in emerging economies. Um, on the uh, the struggle was that on the editorial uh, list it is two people from East Asia, uh, two Lees, uh, Kun Lee, who everybody knows, and John Dong Lee, uh, and and on the other side Slavo, and myself, and somebody else, uh, 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 Meissner uh, from 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 the Higher School of Economics. Um, uh, uh, the struggle was indeed as uh, between between this catching up and the capabilities, uh, the, the technological capability accumulation. Uh, remember, Slavo, I, I really like this. <laughs> um, anyway, so um, Slavo, my, my, uh, my background is uh, economics. I am actually, I, I was educated in mainstream econ um, all the way from beginning to the end. And uh, even today, I, I teach uh, straightforward econ um, as well as uh, a strategy policy on science, technology, innovation. Uh, so my question, I, I, throughout these years, I, I, I saw migration of economists um, in this field from departments of economics, actually, uh, to business schools um, and to schools of international affairs or public policy and so forth. So my question is, what do you think, in your opinion, what what have been the successes of economists here in the in studying innovation, and what have been the major misses? Um, why economics departments, the formal economics departments, do not seem like um, they are central players in this in this debate today? Yeah, your your question actually, uh, I have to explain it because uh, um, I have a title professor of innovation studies and I work with economists, and um, I try to explain it to students in the way that. Uh, um, Economists operate in a two-dimensional world. They have two uh, worlds which consist only of two dimensions. One is the incentives 
And only recently, since 1990s, they discovered that there are institutions which are kind of enmeshed with, with incentives. Why incentives? Because in incentives, uh, uh, relative prices matter and any technological change is instant. You know, you don't have problems on, on a kind of long term. Uh, innovation studies, people we bring in economic two-dimensional world, we bring third dimension, which is the capabilities, because capabilities do not, you know, change automatically. You know that they are cumulative, that they take over time to, to, to develop, that not to result only on market incentives, that there are non-market incentives, the whole uh, academic uh, uh, system and so on. So uh, this is about... Uh, talking about the people with two-dimensional with uh, three-dimensional world. And that's why it is so complicated. That's why I see that kind of, because bringing third dimension means that you really have to understand what is the interaction, what is the co-evolution of these different dimensions. I mean, this is not only for me. I, I, I was surprised to see a long time ago, late Sanjay Alal, he, he had the same kind of uh, idea uh, uh, about that. Because this is the dimension that we bring into the analysis of economy, which fundamentally changes how institutions and, and incentives are uh, interacting with capabilities. And that becomes much more complicated. So I think that the, uh, despite that, that we were so much separated, I think that there is a, a gradual process of convergence because uh, uh, of the acceptance that uh, economies are complex systems. And again, I come to this instrumentation because there is a new instrumentation which can show that economy is a complex system. You can do also system modeling. So as long as we accept that economies are complex evolving systems, so that, is, that gives a more scope to bring economies and, and innovation studies people together. So that's my kind of, if you want, very kind of generic conceptual answer why we operated in, in a different worlds. Because none of the categories which... Uh, uh, people in business school use is related to to uh, capabilities uh, wouldn't come into macroeconomic model uh, wouldn't come in a conventional microeconomic uh, microeconomics so bringing that in changes a lot and and we are now in the process of kind of very confusing world where there are different paradigms it's actually very good for any young scholar because everything is open there is not any more i i think i think there is not any more big church so that that's a kind of giovanni's uh, all the time, you know, fight with a with a great church. Um, so um, yeah, this is how I, I described it. I don't know if you agree with that. Uh, I I I I very much agree. Um, but uh, I also see that the Schumpeterian economics or whatever whatever the evolutionary Schumpeterian whatever that is uh, has some limitations as well. Uh, in the sense that it has not managed actually to incorporate. Um, uh, to uh, effectively incorporate uh, other aspects of the economy that are critical of critical importance. I mean, finance is not a big thing in 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 that uh, in that type of economics, and, and 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 yet it is extremely important, right? So so so, I would think that it's necessary for the two to get to, to get closer. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you just hit the right uh, uh, area, finance. I mean, uh, I mean, you can list on the on, on one hand kind of number of papers which tries to really integrate finance into it, you know, kind of uh, uh, there are really, really, uh, you know, gaps in, in that uh, area. But that is also because of the qualitatively different nature when you think about the uh, capabilities and then finance and, and this relationship. I think this cannot be done simply by uh, by mechanically <laughs> bringing them together. You you need almost like a paradigmatic change in how you conceptualize that uh, because these are very different uh, concepts. There is of course this theory about the boundary objects, you know, objects which sit in between two. So there has to be some really uh, new thinking uh, in order to integrate uh, these things. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, 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 and to tell you the truth, I am I am uh, encouraged by the fact that I see some uh, new, uh, 
you uh, a newer than me i'm old uh, so people who come later uh, who actually try to do this uh, integration like i i have in mind nicholas bloom that i like very much uh, his material um, who who seems to, to to be able to to navigate on both sides um, and and present very very good work okay yeah, so uh, <laughs> so so I think I think when we are thinking about um, <clears throat> what uh, where where is a a, a pretty fertile uh, area for for young people to, to 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 go is is that intersection of 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 yeah. of the uh, of, of the two fields that 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 needs to 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 be worked out somehow um, exactly. Yeah, uh, when, exactly. When... But the, the problem, yeah, with, with academies, problem are always a, a strict disciplinary boundaries, which comes from the organization of academy into departments, and you know, kind of that's a chronic issue. Some places are more open than the others. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, uh, so uh, let me. I will. I will stop here. Um, I will pass the baton to to Yanis, uh, and perhaps I come up with some other uh, questions later. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So yes, please, Yanis. The floor is yours. You're muted. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, well, I would like to congratulate uh, Rajas and uh, the organizers for cho choosing this uh, Slavo Carlota conversation because the, they they were having a conversation for years, for many years, uh, and uh, I I hope it would be very nice if we had Chris still here on the. But his spirit is across going across this uh, event uh, now uh, i will uh, pose a question uh, regarding uh, policy innovation as uh, carlotta mentioned before but before that i want to make some comment on the previous discussion i believe that there is a big problem uh, in economy I, I have a joint background and i have uh, worked in uh, both uh, industry pub uh, public service and uh, uh, academia so perhaps I have a, I'm a bit biased by, by what I say, but I believe that there is a need for real life economics. And this, in, in my in my under, is the misunderstanding of the um, uh, mainstream economics that they have, usually they have another, uh, there are two words, the, the world of the mainstream and the real life uh, uh, world that, uh, uh, people in the innovation studies, management, economics, the industrial economics, they, they are working. So it is very important nowadays to have these links between uh, economics, engineering, and management, and policy. For, uh, they have Because otherwise, I believe that uh, uh, something is missing. For example, talking about policy implications from uh, a, a pure, a pure uh, a mainstream uh, analysis, this is then uh, things are very difficult to, to, to give some new ideas, uh, etc. So, uh, again, people that are in technical universities or engineering uh, schools, and they are dealing with all this transformation that is taking place in all sectors, not only in the ICT, but also in other sectors, and the merging between ICT, nanotechnology, uh, biotechnology, etc. So these people need also to understand the economic and social consequences of, of what they're doing, and also the how they can uh, handle technology and the new technological, uh, uh, let's say, innovations. Uh, and uh, I, I would like to add uh, that also uh, many people, especially uh, good scientists, they think natural scientists, they think that uh, innovation is only based in R&D. You have R&D, you have innovation. And uh, the other is not innovation. So this, again, is another another uh, 
pair of different peoples that uh, they they have to 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 uh, um, work together and to understand both the areas and how not only the areas per se but how uh, they what is the, the let's say the um, uh, behavior when they have to 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 solve problems that are of course multidisciplinary and not just one, one direction now saying all this i th believe that the, uh, the appreciative theorizing in the spirit of Dick uh, Nelson and uh, Winter and all the uh, other uh, careers, etc., uh, is something very, very important in order also to, if you want to be a, a, to, to build a more formal, uh, let's say, framework, it is very important to have this appreciative uh, theorizing before. Um, so I come directly to the question that I need uh, Slavo to answer. The first one is, uh, about the um, uh, the theory and practice of smart, smart specialization. He mentioned that. I believe that this is a great transformation in how you are doing industrial policy linked with innovation or regional policy linked with innovation. And uh, I, I recall in my mind that uh, in 2014, we were both in Vienna where the St. Peter Society conference where, where, where was uh, to taking place. And there at that time, everybody was a bit skeptical. W what is this? How it can, it can be it's that just a theory and how can be transformed to practice, etc. So based on that, I, I now I, I know from your uh, writings that uh, you this uh, uh, skepticism now is a bit uh, going down and you more and more you think that this is a very good uh, let's say merge between innovation policy other types of policy and industrial policy so after uh, six uh, years after the the book that you were co-edited co about the theory and practice of uh, smart specialization what is your assessment and your let's say based on a uh, as an appreciative type of theorizing is now regarding this method, this policy innovation, which started from Europe and it is basically in Europe. And how can this be uh, exported to other places of uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, southern countries or in other uh, in other uh, places? So this is my my question, my first question. Okay. Uh, yes, I'm. Uh, I was involved, and I'm still involved until here into uh, this type of uh, policy studies on on smart specialization, which uh, has emerged uh, as a result of um, imagination, or, or in fact, of a few academics. But then it, it took life on its own because it was uh, recognized in kind of in its uh, um, insight idea by by policymakers. Although there was no clear design how to go about it so there was this process of uh, of of uh, kind of trying to find out what is it kind of trying to articulate that and and today after 10 years there's a huge uh, it's it's huge industry i call it the, the biggest uh, experiment in uh, innovation policy in the world and it is because the the number of, of regions the number of uh, the the funding that comes the number of people engaged and the number of papers the whole industry of papers you can make just Today, journal on smart specialization, you will have uh, issues every month, you know, kind of. So, uh, uh, the, so there is a lot of kind of there, which is uh, new, which uh, now because of the impact of the EU, because of its simply global position, uh, goes uh, global. But I, that's one thing. But the second thing is that we have to understand that uh, uh, this is only one of the approaches in innovation policy, which I call it, actually, I, I label it new industrial policy. And, and, and in this book, which you refer, I, I, I put it in the context of six other approaches, uh, which are also present around the world in different forms. Why they all are kind of features of the new industrial policy? They are all features uh, of, of the new approach, which uh, uh, points to, from, from the fact that the there is no enlightened policymaker. There is no somebody who uh, has a magic solution how you go about the climate change and and what are the type of restructuring changes that, that this is something which is a uh, 
where each of the stakeholders uh, in, in innovation uh, policy has its view on that situation. And therefore, you have to organize the, the process by which you can kind of elicit these kind of uh, different views and, and the process of negotiation. So that, that kind of, and, and this is something which has been recognized in, in many other areas of life and in other parts of the world. So, so there is a lot of, which is common there. What happened in the meantime, that we have even increasing uh, complexity before our eyes of the of, of, of the climate change and need for transformative socioeconomic change. There comes this kind of conceptualization through transformative innovation policy. So the, the um, smart specialization is not anymore just about the your competitiveness about the, the one region, but it becomes more about the sustainability. It, it links to the UN objective. It resonates much more with other countries. And, but then how do you bring sustainability into that? We have now an industry of papers on the transformative uh, innovation policy, not uh, from, from innovation policy people, but there is a, in Europe, there's a lot of journalists and academics who, who work on these uh, uh, transformative uh, issues. And this is a now a kind of an issue mm -hmm. where uh, academics are part of that process. Uh, so in a sense, we were complaining before that we are separated, there is this gap, but now, there is an opportunity uh, to link up these two things uh, uh, together because the challenges which uh, we are faced, no academic side does not have recipes, policy side doesn't have recipes. So it's a kind of really uh, process of, uh, of, of a discovery where crucial is this institutional context, how you can ensure this interaction. Uh, but so the whole issue is now reframe it uh, smart specialization for sustainability which means that uh, your scope, the range of, of actors which come into that process in, in, in transformative change becomes ever bigger and the and, uh, uh, problem becomes even more uh, complex. So, so this, is, this is where we are now. So uh, um, at least in Europe, there will be no academic, which in some way will not be uh, exposed or, or will not have to know something about it. And I think it's just an issue of time when... Uh, where, where other parts of the world kind of uh, pick up much more strongly uh, on, on, on that uh, uh, perspective. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Uh, and the second one, uh, because we have, uh, uh, I learned a lot when we had a discussion at SPRU uh, in 1999 about uh, your uh, assessment and your um, idea about the multiple uh, influence of Chris Freeman. Uh, and uh, it was this uh, discussion, part of this discussion was also in the Greek edition of the book of uh, Work for All or Mass Unemployment. Uh, and uh, in, in my view, it was very precise and very interesting. Uh, uh, and I believe that you can, if you can, say something about that and about the multiple influence that Chris Freeman has uh, in the, at several levels. Yes, uh, since we talked about that, in the meantime, I had the uh, opportunity to work with the uh, Iranian colleagues on the bibliometric analysis of literature on catching up. So because I'm enough old to be in that area for, for 30 years and I know all the people uh, personally, but then you have bibliometric data. You have a, who is publishing and who is citing whom. Who is citing whom is a sign of, um, let's call it cognitive or, or scientific links there. And here I want to put uh, Chris Freeman. If you uh, evaluate Chris Freeman on that basis, you will see, yes, important. But because I know Chris, I know people that he influenced, you know, personally, then I can see that... Uh, um, in addition to this kind of influence, which is revealed in some kind of objective manner, objective I put in inverted commas, Chris' influence is actually much bigger in terms of uh, personal influences and the way how people think about the issues. Uh, when I first uh, read first Chris's paper, that was a long, long time ago, and I always keep telling that when I read it, I said, my God, this man is really a humanist. Because I could see the... The, although the papers were on, on technology, but they were difficult to put in one 
area, like this is economics or technological change. No, this was a, a merger of different insights from the social sciences, humanistic perspective on all of that, which today becomes even more relevant in the view of artificial intelligence, where the, 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 the boundary between technology and the human beings becomes completely inseparable. And therefore, this perspective, I think, will only gain in importance because it's impossible to, to separate kind of your uh, human welfare from the technology itself. So Chris's perspective will be even more important. But the, 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 the second point here is that the influence that we make through uh, conversations, through explaining the context, this goes well beyond, oh, I read your paper and I, I, I saw this genius idea. Because you can influence the way uh, people think, how they can see the problems. You can influence them almost in terms of value and everything. And in that respect, I think those of us who were uh, able to be close to him were in a privileged position. The same as everybody's privileged to be, you know, in the proximity of, of, a, of a really good scholar because the, the uh, that's where I see the, um, the difference, what kind of codified information, what written text can do and what just personal exchange can do. And that's why I like this... Uh, um, also, the way we communicate today, because we communicate outside of the, you know, uh, a paper and, and what is exactly there, we, we try to get understanding of the context in which we are. So, so this understanding is, is I think, uh, in that respect, uh, Chris's contribution is invisible, but I can see it in many, many scholars that work in this area that were uh, exposed to, to his uh, uh, influence. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, so thank you, Yanis. Um, we have some questions from the audience. So if Rajesh agrees, I'll start addressing them or, or asking people actually to unmute themselves and, and ask those questions. So we had the question, I don't know if Igor Yegorov will, will um, want to ask it uh, himself. It was when we were talking about metrics and some inappropriate ways to to use them for policy. Igor, do you would you like to unmute yourself and, and ask it? But the eyes I'll just mention here that uh, if you know, yeah, I'll just mention that he said that uh, yeah, number of US US patents not even the most vivid example. And how about the importance of the share <laughs> of foreign students? Uh, from the non-EU countries. Yeah, Igor is here. He is from Kiev, so we have to give him time. You know, this is a, this was simply, you know, one component of uh, this. Um, how to say, European indicator. Uh, you know, this uh, in the European index. Of course, it's not relevant for our economies. I mean, not only for Ukraine, for the Ukrainian economy, but also for for the economies of say Central Asian countries or you know economies of the post other post Soviet states. Uh, and actually, I have a question to Slavo. You know, Slavo, I remember some years ago you have prepared a, a special index for East European countries, probably with Croatian co colleagues, and you had a presentation. You know, this would it be possible to develop a further development of this index? You know, simply to find to find some kind of substitution for uh, for, for this European innovation. Uh, index that uh, we used for we used for developed countries of Europe, you know, first of all, and to compare, you know, Europe with, uh, with the United States, with Japan, with some other countries. Yes, I mean, what, because you are referring to the um, European Innovation Scoreboard, which initially was designed primarily for uh, uh, ranking, benchmarking uh, European Union with the US and, and Japan, and, and then of course, later on, they had a lot of uh, um, modifications and we have to appreciate the efforts that uh, people have put and are putting continuously because they have a almost impossible task to um, have a metrics which also has to is, is changing continuously. You can see that, you know, these modifications are quite uh, often. Of course, uh, out of their scope, uh, uh, many of the countries that we are talking uh, and um, so we again come to this, uh, whether it is possible to have uh, one metrics which is good for everybody. And if we, th this we have a kind of really an issue of uh, um, metrics which is uh, global, but is not relevant for everybody. And uh, 
uh, or whether globally it can be relevant for for anybody you know kind of everybody would have its own because it's a dynamic process so um yes uh, there is absolutely need I, I need even now even more as we have increasing divergences among countries uh, and this is the process of the last uh, uh, 10 years uh, uh, even within the EU where the EU is not any more convergence machine uh, so the, the, the uh, necessity to have a more uh, matrices which are specific, which are tailored to specific group of countries because they are much bigger relevance to 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 uh, policymakers and and to uh, for understanding what are the technology upgrading uh, challenges. So we just have to find the, the way to uh, to find some funding, not big for 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 this type of issues. Yeah, completely agree with with your uh, um, expression of need for more relevant. Uh, Matrices yeah, for groups of countries, definitely. Thank you, sir. Yeah, all right. In my list here, I have uh, David Francis. Please go ahead. Oh, uh, uh, thank you, and uh, hello, hello uh, to uh, uh, to you, Carlos and, and, and Slavo. Uh, <laughs> I, I actually have uh, two questions. The first one, I think I could be accused of uh, special pleading because I, I come from a sociological rather than an economic uh, background. And you mentioned, Slavo, that uh, uh, you, you got a lot out of the study of cases and uh, 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 qualitative research into organizations. And my uh, first question is, uh, why do you think that there's so little interdependence and understanding between uh, uh, those from an, uh, an economic tradition and those from a sociological tradition? Because, after all, a, a lot of uh, 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 studies are done in, in both areas on the dynamics of change and uh, what it takes to be innovative. Um, why there is a, so little? Well, one can always use excuse of the academic boundaries, but that will not leave us, doesn't answer eventually the question. I think there is a, also a deeper reason, and that is that uh, only recently economists uh, understood that uh, if you look at the data from industrial economics on the uh, firm demography, you see huge heterogeneity among firms in very narrowly defined sectors. And you have a coexistence of highly productive and, and very unproductive firms. So this huge stylized effect have to be explained. And of course, economists have now idea, okay, we will explain it by organization capabilities, but we don't know what they are and we cannot put the, our hands on it, what it is. We don't have a set of indicators. Actually, you can never explain that uh, uh, specificity, that huge heterogeneity, unless you you bring organizational soci sociology into it. So, uh, but it takes time <laughs> to, to come to that. So I said, uh, uh, be patient a little bit. Hopefully somebody will come and, and will do PhD uh, combining these two perspectives, you know. Kind of, yeah. I'll I, I, I put my hand up to have a try. Now I'll just ask one <laughs> other question. And that is uh, in the most uh, recent uh, study uh, undertaken uh, by McKinsey of the preoccupations of uh, uh, top CEOs around the world. Uh, it, it was organizational agility rather than innovation, which now comes up as a top five preoccupation. In fact, uh, uh, a few years ago, uh, uh, being effectively innovative was in the top five. And I, I'm curious to know whether or not organizational agility is something which really needs to enter into the kinds of studies which you've been talking about. Um, I don't have a straight answer, but my first uh, you know, gut feeling is that you have, um, in terms of policy, you have that converted on a different uh, concept, and that is the concept of resilience. Uh, so this is how I see how policy today tries maybe to 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 relate to this uh, uh, organizational agility as the top of concern of of, of uh, CEOs. Uh, 
I don't know. What What do you think? Is that the kind of because resilience is a, from a from a macro perspective is something which policymakers can uh, can handle. I don't know if you tell them, oh, organizational agility is something which we have to support. I mean, it's difficult to translate on their language. We are all the time faced with this. Uh... If if I could just give a a, a short example, uh, just uh, recently, uh, uh, Mars. Uh, not the not the planet, but but the company have uh, bought uh, a, a company in the UK called uh, Hotel Chocolates or Chocolat, and uh, by buying that, they uh, they move themselves from being a producer of confectionery into being capable of being a retailer. So it's an agile activity rather than an innovation uh, activity. The work is not innovating. The work is acquiring a new resource and an, an, an asset. And I see that kind of recombination of resources, uh, acquiring different resources as being under uh, explored within innovation studies uh, as they are typically okay you, you are now talking about the innovation studies I, I was before talking about the policy yeah uh, absolutely right this is the the what is the scope of innovation studies so what you are pointing is that this much broader um, boundaries of what is the innovation studies kind of which which has to go much beyond the a specific innovation as, as as an object. This is a uh, what we you know mentioned in in Carlotta's about the innovation and learning. You know, kind of this is a type of changes which, which are then a part of much broader understanding of what uh, makes organizations different. So I, I can just say yeah, exactly on the point. And yeah. and, and, and I, I I will shut up in a second. But coming at it from uh, the point of view of uh, uh, of Tees, what we're talking about here is innovation studies within dynamic capabilities uh, and uh, the interface between the sociology, the economics uh, and uh, uh, other dimensions of dynamic capabilities, including leadership qualities and so on. That means rewriting a bit uh, technology management books. Yeah. OK, to, to well, it, it, it will keep us out of mischief doing it. <laughs> uh, may, maybe you should talk to John Besant and make a new addition to to get that on board. I I I I I I'm I'm going to see him next week, so uh, I'll have a chat <laughs> with him about. It. <laughs> so this so was much. useful meeting. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. So now, uh, apologies to Thomas, I, I actually skipped you, but please go ahead and ask your question. Maybe keep it. You had I saw that you had three questions. Maybe you can frame into one, one, one big one. Or brief. Okay. Uh, thanks, Sergio. I will try my best, you know, to squeeze three in one. So <laughs> hi, Slavo. Hi, Kalota. Hi, hi, everyone. Um, Slavo. Um, well. Um, I'm going to have to pick one of the two questions. Um, let's start with the first one. Um, policymakers, you know, you mentioned smart specialization. Yes, uh, we did that in the field of innovation studies. We provided this kind of theoretical synthesis to policymakers. Yet policymakers still fall back to the linear model of innovation. So wherever you talk to policymakers in the end, in the back of their head is that linear model of innovation, linearity. So that was my first question, like uh, how we deal with this? Because that's, you know, like the biggest question, no matter what we do in science, no matter if we show them that this model is not a good one, in the end, that's how they deal with innovation. The other point is about us as innovation scholars and in particular our output, publications. When you look into research policy, over the years, we feel like we're becoming the cheerleaders of mainstream economic methods. All of a sudden, we fell in love with econometrics. Yet Chris, Carlotta here, Nathan Rosenberg, and all these scholars, uh, you know, Nelson Winter never really use econometrics. So this is for me like another irony. Somehow we discovered econometrics too late and we fell in love with them. So it's it's a bit ironic. Um, 
but also would like to hear your thoughts. And last but not least, what lies ahead for Neoshubitarian economics? So what is our future? You know, we're young scholars, we really like Neoshubitarian economics. So what is for us there? So what do we should be looking at? You know, what are the main issues? Okay, thank you. Great, because three questions, I'll try to be very brief on, on each of them. Uh, on linearity and policy makers, um, I wouldn't blame, um, I, I, I wouldn't put blame entirely on policymakers. Well, first of all, there is this political element. You know, r and has uh, institutionalized interests. They have articulated interests, which influences everybody. Okay? But the second one is, uh, let's say I'm a light in policymakers and I fully take your story on board, but I don't know what to do next. I don't have indicators. I don't have a clear idea of the policy tools. The whole uh, uh, mode of thinking around me is against that. So it's a more complex story where we also have to do uh, much more in terms of uh, providing um, uh, policy tools which which address the the, the other issues which are non R and D related and indicators. It, it, that means you know uh, a change in communication with statistical offices, uh, having a new type of service which point to. The, so I, I think the issue is is. Uh, is on both uh, sides. On this uh, mainstream, yes. I mean, well, you picked up uh, research policy, which is going mainstream, but this is where the mainstream is. Um, and I appreciate your work. I, I would like to advertise you here because Thanos has a, is one of the first scholars in innovation studies which uh, applies this logic of critical realism, which is a new philosophy of science, where the whole issue of causality uh, is, is reframed. And I think the, the, the problem with the uh, econometrics is exactly the issue of causality. We know that, you know, kind of that's somebody there. So you need alternative uh, philosophies and, and the critical realism as a new philosophy uh, and, and Thanos uh, really shows the, the way how uh, case study can generate new theories and, and how the whole view on causality, that the point is uh, on the causality mechanism. So I strongly recommend. So I think, uh, Thanos, I would simply encourage you, your work is is one of the ways the way, which kind of new type of mainstream, which is a much closer to understanding the causality, because at the end, that's what science is about. Yeah. Econometrics is always approximation of that, is always approximation. And, and econometricians, are good econometricians are fully aware of it. What lies for neo superterians I think it's, a, you can be very pessimistic, but you can be very, very uh, basically exciting because uh, technology is all around us in a very different forms. And the boundaries between the, what was economics of, of innovation and, and all other disciplines is really uh, closing so much that I think for a, for a young scholar who is uh, courageous enough to get out of the dominant paradigm, whatever it is his supervisor has, who wants to kind of go around and, and go into new areas, the same as you did with, with a, a critical realism perspective. I think uh, there is a huge uh, opportunity there. So I, I would be really much more optimistic because we, our physical world, the kind of natural world is now replaced by, by our virtual world around, which is all about technology and human beings and economy and welfare, individual and social. So um, there's a new agenda emerging. Thank you for the advertisement. I didn't expect that. So, but uh, thank you, you for answering you my questions. That. Thank you. you. That. So, thanks a lot. And uh, we actually missed uh, questions in the chat here. So, apologies. Uh, back there, we have uh, Dimitri Korpakids. Would you like to 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 unmute yourself, please? And and I'll ask all the remaining participants to to be brief as we are reaching the two hour time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, just a question to, to Slavo, since he is very specialized on this. Uh, and uh, I think you, you mentioned the, the debate on industrial policy is back uh, in Europe, but also in the United States. So how would you see the link between, I would say, state-led industrial policies on the one hand, and regional innovation policies, uh, especially in the context of developing smart specialization? Strategies. You mentioned that, and uh, you know, we have been discussing this in the past. Uh, but I see this um, this kind of uh, controversy between uh, uh, top-down strategies and I would say bottom bottom-up. And then you have always the the impression that there is no real uh, meeting these two 
uh, uh, trends uh, somewhere in a more productive way. A good example is the resilience and recovery facility, for example, where a lot of money has been already committed uh, on uh, huge projects uh, without really sufficiently taking into account uh, what is going on on the ground and the real capabilities of uh, people in the region. So how would you react to this? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, uh, you are pointing to the um, state is back uh, in the context of the EU, where actually we have this uh, dominant paradigm of single market. And, and uh, the challenge is now, how do you bring into the logic of, of single market, which is the main unifying factor into the EU, how do you bring kind of industrial policy? Uh, that's the first challenge. Second is uh, uh, capacities because it cannot be confined on state. All we were talked about the transformative innovation policy, regional policy. You can think only about the multi-level governance, but then what are the policy capacities? And the issue of policy capacities for transformative innovation policy is still under the carpet. And this is where lots of kind of uh, academics can, can do in terms of exploring what does it mean institutional capacity. I almost was involved once in, in, a, uh, uh, in a project on, on a country on that, and I had to fight to have a, exploration of institutional capacity, because this was not seen as a kind of legitimate uh, um, uh, issue. So I, I think uh, it's uh, if we confine it on the state, we are nowhere, because uh, in many uh, East European countries, in many middle income countries, state is simply very weak, you know, kind of it's a weak actor. So you have to think in a broader terms, what is the policy capacity, which can be uh, generated also by other players in the economy, industrial association, regions, and so on. So, so there is, again, a need for a change in, in the paradigm in thinking. It's not state or market, but it's a more complex world. Yeah. So that that's because we are running out of time. I'm trying to be as brief as possible. Yeah. Right. Thank you. So we have a comment and a question from Dmitry Prehanov. So maybe you could ask your question, Dmitry, and people can read your comment on the chat. Thank you. Um, thank you a lot for this very insightful discussion here. Um, I have a question about the policy design in transition economies and, so to say, developing countries. Um, because, well, um, there might be some in insufficient progress in innovation policy uh, designed within transition economies. And one of the major reasons for that might be that uh, policymakers have narrow understanding of the innovation policy space. And because of relevance of top-down regulatory approaches, uh, they can achieve um, the policy objectives. So, um, well, one of the questions might be um, how to enable soft law mechanisms uh, in innovation policy in transition economies. Well, they say this is a million dollar question uh, because yes. there is no uh, a simple answer, but I think the way I would structure the, the, the issue is, first of all, that the um, capacity for policy design is only one of the type of capacities which uh, are deficient. Because at the end, design, you can even you know, outsource it, you know, give it to World Bank, but then you have to have capacity to implement it. Then the whole uh, new type of policies is not just somebody design fully. You can design some basic things, but policy of this type of transformative innovation policy, which engages a large number of stakeholders, has to be co-created with them. If I'm not part of the policy process, the policy design process, I will not uh, be basic. I will do everything to destroy it. I, I can give you an example from my own kind of advisory activities where ministers simply put it in a in a in a drawer because uh, they were not part of the process. Full stop. You know, kind of. and then you have to have policy for monitoring evaluation for learning based on that. So it's a kind of more complex issue where you you cannot confine it just on on, on the design. So if, as long as you persuade policymakers that they have to think in in a more broader terms, what is their policy capacity? Then you can do some improvements. Yeah. So that is the. Right. Uh, I see the Atla have said that he has a, 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 a comment and perhaps you could ask yourself and be perhaps brief as well. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for the opportunity to see uh, good old colleagues and, and meet new colleagues. 
Uh, we were talking a lot about metrics. I would like to share an anecdotal evidence showing that in the EC circles, in the European Commission circles, uh, measurement of innovation, the innovation scoreboard, and especially the European Innovation, uh, the, the Summary Innovation Index, is a political issue as well. So it's not, uh, referring back to Mariana, it's not, not only innovation is political, but the measurement of innovation is also political. So someone who is very close to this process uh, has shared uh, the evidence that he or she was talking to the colleagues working for the commission, for the relevant unit in the commission, and they admitted that uh, it, it is a weak attempt. It, it, I mean, in terms of methodological, uh, in, in, in the mirror of, of methods, it's really weak. There is no need to uh, repeat why it is weak. But the, the kind of verdict was, yes, we know it's weak, but because it is interesting for politicians and also it uh, uh, gathers some, some press coverage, we continue like this. And a somewhat related point is that uh, we were also talking about uh, measurement, qualitative and quantitative methods, political economy of, of innovation. So my my concern is that uh, uh, economics of innovation is, and, and Thanos mentioned that quantitative studies of econometrics is becoming very popular in research policy as well, for instance. So my concern is in that respect that uh, economics of innovation might not be uh, social science anymore. When it started by, by colleagues at SPRU many years ago, 50 years ago or so, it was truly social science. And Slavo has stressed that it, it's, it, it, it has to keep uh, its, its, its nature, that's feature, because it's, it's a societal and political process. But unfortunately, because of, of the kind of tyranny of methods, it, it, it would be really difficult to, to maintain that, that approach, that angle. Thank you. Okay, this is a comment, nice comment. Um, uh, yeah, reflects. Uh, I can give uh, more extreme examples where uh, the indicator becomes policy objectives. Uh, I worked some time ago in in country which is now on the other side of the of the wall, uh, Belarus, where they established uh, um, interministerial group whose task was uh, to see how they can improve on different indicators of global competitiveness index, so that they go up. So the idea was not uh, what do we do about education, no, how do we what do we do so that this indicator we are up, so in collectively we are kind of acceptable. And this is not only that country. So this is a complete perversion where the indicator is not just a poor proxy of reality and we have our real policy objectives but indicators be, indicator itself becomes objective so we we you are talking about the current hungarian government as well okay okay a country has joined the club okay yes very prestigious club very promising okay Okay, so we are heading towards the end, but uh, Rajesh told me that we have uh, uh, some minutes if someone has like a, a really urgent question to be made and we can definitely address it now. No urgent ones, no problem. <laughs> this is, uh, I guess, more of a, uh, long discussion topics anyway. So uh, I'd like to thank all the the participants of this webinar, the audience. It's very important that you you, you show up. And Thanos, do you have something? No. Ah, okay. And and uh, I'd like to thank especially the speakers, Lavo, Kalota, Gabriela, Nicholas, and Yanis. And a special thanks to Rajesh and the CIS team. They do an amazing work putting these webinars together, organizing everything. I thank Professor Baskaran of the University of Malaya North South Research Center for the Zoom and website support. And 
Rajesh, if you want to put up the the slide with the next uh, webinar so people uh, can see you, what are the 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 in conversation series next event will be about. And there you have it. So thank you very much for attending it. And I hope to see you on January 28th of next year. Thank All you right. to us, to, to Rajesh. Thanks to everybody, colleagues, for, for your time. Much appreciated. See you sometime somewhere, OK? Thanks, Lavo. In person. Bye. OK, bye. thank you very much. Bye, bye. Thanks, bye. Bye, thank bye. you. Bye, bye. Thank you so much. Bye, bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Rajesh. Thank you for organizing wonderful event. Thank you. Thank you very much Thank for the support. You. Thank you very much.